is the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 20th chapter. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought that they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. When they, when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, these last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, friends, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this, this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Grace and peace be unto you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, we're going to show you a little video clip, but I want to introduce it here at the beginning. Uh, one of probably my favorite show on television is a show called The Office. And uh, several years ago, there was this episode where Michael, who is the office manager, uh, is going on a sales call, and he is driving, and Dwight, uh, the salesman, is off to the right. And uh, it's a rental car with a GPS unit in between. And uh, this is what happens. Right, turn. Wait, 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 no, 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 no. It means bear right. No, Up there. It said right, so take a right. No, 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 look. It, it means go up to the right, bear right, over the bridge, and hook up with 307. Right, all right. Maybe it's right. a shortcut, Dwight. It's like go to the right. It can't mean that. There's well, a light there. He knows where it's going. The, the machine knows. The Stop yelling at me. No, it's up there. Yeah. There's no light here. Remain calm. I have trained for this. Are okay. you? I said the window. Here we go. Make a new turn. Yes, I said so we'll cut it there, but uh, it's the kind of thing you would come to expect from Michael as you watch the show, but uh, Michael was convinced the GPS was right. He was convinced, despite all human reason, that uh, he was going the right way. And when you are convinced of something in this life, it means you're complete, completely certain of something. In uh, Acts chapter 8, and leading into Acts chapter 9, there's a man in the Bible named Saul who was absolutely convinced. Saul was convinced that he was right, that he had the right way of thinking. In his mind, the only type, of, the only good Christian was a Christian who was either behind bars or who was put to death. And so that's what he spent his time doing. But one day on this, he has this, he's on a journey to Damascus. And all of a sudden, the spirit of Jesus speaks to him. It's sort of like a GPS, and we might think about it as a God positioning system. All of a sudden, the spirit of Jesus speaks to him, and that voice points him in a new direction. The voice says, Saul, stop persecuting me. Stop what you're doing. It's as if to say you've been playing on the wrong team. It's time for you to join the other side. It's time to you, for you to become a follower of Christ. And in the aftermath of that event, that's what happened. 
Saul or Paul as we uh, come to know him becomes a follower of Christ. But we all know that we know as human beings that if someone has inflicted so much pain for so long, if all of a sudden they start saying, I'm a changed person, it's hard to forgive them. It's hard to see them as a different person. Paul was blessed, though, because he had some of the pillars of the early church. Specifically, he had a man named Barnabas, who pretty much, what you would say, put his arm around him and walked with him and sort of vouched for him, saying, yes, this is indeed a changed man. He's not pretending. He is indeed a follower of Christ who somehow there's been a radical transformation in his heart. So Barnabas was saying, in a sense, he was sort of standing between him, Paul, and the rest, sort of saying, I vouch for him, you vouch for him as well. Um, so they, Paul and Barnabas began to hang out in a place called Antioch. We're going to show you two maps this morning. But uh, Antioch, you'll see sort of on the, uh, the, Mediter the Mediterranean coast, north of Jerusalem, where the star is. And they, uh, they spent a significant amount of time in Antioch, sort of practicing the faith, beginning to teach about the faith, uh, sort of growing as followers of Jesus. And it, it pretty much said that Saul, uh, Paul began to be viewed as a spiritual leader, began to, in a sense, be an elder in this Antioch community. And the church was growing in that place. And they were probably very, very happy that the church was growing. People were being drawn to the mission of Jesus. And they could have just said, this is all we're ever going to be. But they uh, felt a sense of responsibility that they couldn't just be contained there. They felt a responsibility to reach out further. And I think that's an important thing. You know, it sort of like tells our story here at the church that uh, about, ten year, about seven or eight years ago, we could have been satisfied with where we were at, but we sensed a responsibility to reach out further, to expand what we were doing, to reach more people for Jesus. But they, in that community, they basically picked two leaders, Barnabas and Paul, and in a sense, say, go out, share the good news in other communities, and draw, help draw them to Christ. So on that map, you'll see they set sail for the island of Cyprus, spent time there. Once they hit the other side of the island, they headed north to the mainland, went to places like Pamphylia, Pisidia, Iconium, Lystra, Derby. They had ups and downs along the way at one point, uh, in one place, the people thought all of a sudden, they, these are gods. They thought Paul and Barnabas were gods. And Paul basically called a time out and said, no, this is not about us. i got to tell you about Jesus, whom I serve, who will change your life. Uh, along the way, there were, a, a, in a sense, a manhunt, people following Paul and Barnabas. And they were so irritated with him, when they got to Leicester and Derby, they tried to stone Paul to death. And they left him for dead on the ground. And they left, but amazingly, Paul survived. And I don't know about you, if, I was, if someone threw rocks at me and put me to the point of death, I think I would head the opposite direction away from them. But what Paul did was got up, reversed direction, went back to all those communities that he had reached out to to begin with. You could say that's either foolish or courageous or the mission of God had so captivated him that he, he wouldn't be stopped. Uh, they end up back at Antioch, and Acts 14 summarizes it and says, uh, God has opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. Previous to this, it had been just reaching out to the Jewish synagogues, and all of a sudden it said, no, they expanded beyond their comfort zone. The uh, church in Jerusalem got wind of this missionary journey, and in many ways they were kind of happy with what had happened. And uh, the question was, would Jerusalem really accept non-Jewish people. But in Acts 15, yes, they indeed said, we will. And they sent a representative, Silas, up to, uh, up, up to Antioch to basically say to them, we bless, we bless your outreach to the Gentiles. Just live ethically, live morally, don't, uh, don't uh, follow idols, and uh, don't eat certain types of food. But whatever you do, just keep going out, sharing the good news, and give that instruction. Um, Paul and Barnabas, said uh, at one point they had hung out in Antioch a little bit longer, began to reconnect there. And then they said, hey, we, we should go back. We should go back and visit these places we've visited. And they were about to do that, but somehow there was a, a bad argument, as human beings do, get in arguments. And uh, their partnership sort of breaks up at this point. 
And Barnabas goes his own way and he heads back to Cyprus, but uh, Silas, the representative of Jerusalem, uh, joins Paul. And they head back, we're going to go to that next slide. They head uh, from Antioch up through uh, to, Ico to Lystra, Derby, and Iconium, the places where Paul was nearly executed. And that's probably the last place I'd want to go, but that's where they headed. And uh, it was there they picked up a young man named Timothy. And uh, Timothy uh, becomes very important, and it's a reminder to all of us of the importance of youth. He had that youthful spirit and became a leader himself, but no doubt the mentorship of Paul and Silas was critical. You know, the uh, um, Acts 16 sort of says, as they're on this journey, sort of like the GPS speaks again. They were going to go to Asia, but it says the GPS, if you will, says don't go to Asia. The spirits, they were going to go to Bithynia, and the spirit says don't go that direction. Pretty much the only direction the spirit said is go forward. Go forward, they end up at this, on the, on the coast of the Aegean Sea in, in the port of Troas. And in that port one night, Paul has a very significant vision. It's very, very specific and realistic to him. As he's in that port of Troas one night, uh, he's, he sees a man of Macedonia, a person with a name, a face, a story. He uh, sees him begging and pleading and saying, come to Macedonia and help us. Come to Macedonia and help us. If you've ever encountered someone begging, you know that they're not going to take no for an answer. It's not just a suggestion. They really absolutely want and are demanding your help right then and there. But the other thing to see is it's an absolute op open invitation that if you show up, that if you take the step of faith to help them, that your, your witness will be accepted. Paul is a man who uh, really, really uh, had a lot of visions. He had a lot of visions. He had, uh, had the experience of God speaking to him numerous times. The first one certainly was... Uh, a very profound one when he was knocked off the horse, if you will, which was, stop persecuting me, join my side. There were several visions we had, which one, one vision was, Paul, get out of where you are. You're going to be executed if you stay there. I need you longer. Go to somewhere else. And that's what he did. Three times, in a sense, he was just, uh, the spirit of Jesus spoke to him which, and was saying, have courage. Don't give up. Keep your witness here. I, I need you not only there, but I need you down the road in other places. So have good courage. And finally, the vision we get today, which was, in a sense, a witness of an open door, that Paul's witness was needed in a place called Macedonia. And the people of Macedonia certainly had names, faces, stories, and they were asking Paul and his followers to be the hands and feet and voice of Jesus. Uh, Macedonia, and we, we saw it on the map, you could all point to it on a map, um, is, a, is a point of Europe. It's the first time Paul sets foot on European soil. And uh, over the next couple weeks, we're going to be looking at what happened when he went to Macedonia. And we'll be looking at his, Paul's letter to the Philippians. But what I want to suggest to you is Macedonia is not just a point on a map. It's not the, just that second slide, a point on the map. Macedonia, in my mind, is about our spirituality being put into action. It's about our faith being put into action in new areas and in new ways. It's a reminder to us that there are always new people who need to be reached in every community. To me, Macedonia represents each of us stepping beyond our comfort zones to help more people, to be more generous, to step up and care more profoundly and what I love about what Janelle read, the final verse she read, is no longer, it's not just about Paul, it's about the whole community embracing that vision. They began to speak using we language. It says, uh, we got ready to head to Macedonia. It's in a sense saying the Christian community was ready to mobilize and step beyond their comfort zone. The key is it wasn't just Paul, it was every one of them being involved in mission. You know, I, I know that... Uh, my opening little clip was a tad bit silly. Maybe it's bordering on ridiculous Michael driving into the water. Uh, it's comedy in itself. The image of him driving into the water. But it makes the point. The image for us to remember 
is that the Spirit of God leads us to the waters of our baptism. We remember that when we went into the waters of baptism, we were claimed as children of God, told we are going to be loved dearly forever, and we know that that love will never, ever end for us. What Luther reminded, Luther said, remember your baptism daily. When we emerge from our remembering our baptisms on a daily basis, we realize life is about living with gratitude and joy and doing our best to exemplify Jesus' attitude and his ways wherever we go. Jesus, indeed, represented humble service, okay? What Kevin's going Kevin's to lead us in a couple minutes in what's called the Christ hymn from Philippians 2. We're not going to read, we're not going to do the Apostles' Creed as we, we normally do. But what Kevin will start us with is, let each of us look not to our own interests, but to the interests of others. And it goes on saying, let the, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Read those words, say them, take them to heart, because that's really what Christ calls us to be. Serve with humility and look beyond ourselves. Macedonia is not over in Europe. Yeah, it might, we could find it on a map. What I want to suggest to all of us, our Macedonia is here right in Montgomery County, all around us. There are people with tangible, physical, spiritual, and emotional needs. Every morning, Every morning, you and I, in a sense, our home base is the port of Troas. Every morning when we rise, get dressed, head out the front door, know that the Spirit of Jesus is saying there are people out there begging for us to come and help. And will we have the courage, in a sense, to sail to Macedonia and reach out and represent Christ?